Hello and welcome to the Latcast. Today we have an amazing episode for you with the one and only Gennaro Negro. Gennaro is an Italian-American born and raised in New Jersey that now plays on loan from AS Roma at Potenza Calcio, a team in the third division of Italian football. This is a great episode. We talked through a bunch of different things, including the American national team, his rise to professional soccer at Roma, and even you know some other bits and pieces such as funny stories at Roma. Enjoy this episode and don't forget to subscribe and follow. Links in the description. Thanks. Squad out. Today, I'm joined by Gennaro Negro, a defensive midfielder with a playing style of Tiago Malta, an Italian-American born in New Jersey who plays at Potenza Calcio in the Serie C, the third division of Italian football. Welcome onto the pod. Thank you, man. Appreciate yeah, it. sure. Of course. Um, excited. We have, so previously, I, I've, I've interviewed um, a goalkeeper, center back in Niga Kerr and Alex Porto, so now we have the defensive midfielder. So slowly but surely, we're building out the, the Ladcast starting 11. So we're making steps towards that for sure. All right, so let's take it all the way back to your, the beginning of your academy career. You began your uh, career with uh, New York Red Bulls Academy as well as PDA, um, both in New Jersey. Was there a point where you, could, you realized that while training in these uh, facilities that you could potentially make it past PDA and, and such and into semi-professional and even professional leagues? Mm-hmm. I think... The moment of realization was when I was around 11, I believe, about to turn 12, a group of guys from PDA, we all uh, came together and we made this team to go actually compete in this tournament in Portugal called the Mundialito. It's like Mm -hmm. one of the biggest youth tournaments in, in Europe where all the best youth clubs are there. Barcelona, Real Madrid, Milan, Benfica. Sporting all of these clubs. Um, so I think while we were there, and I think being able to compare myself from a young age against, especially having that experience to compare myself to players around the world, you know, it was kind of reassuring and definitely kept me concentrated and, you know, to have eyes on the prize and be like, okay, maybe this is actually an option for me because mm-hmm. I think everyone as a kid, especially when you grow up playing the sport, your objective is always to, to play at the <laughs> highest course. level. Um, yeah. And I think having that experience from, from a young age gave me confirmation as to what I was mm. doing and to continue on the right path. Mm. So I guess when you, when you saw these, these big European teams and such at this tournament, were you sort of, or maybe further on, did you think that maybe abroad is the path for me? Yeah, funny that you say that. So uh, when I was actually in middle school, um, I remember a teacher telling us like, Oh, I think I was in sixth grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A teacher's teacher telling us to write something. When you finish eighth grade, what do you want to have accomplished? And I wrote Mm -hmm. on the piece of paper, I said, hopefully I'm in Europe playing soccer. (laughs) Nice. So I hadn't, it it was lost for, I don't know how long I actually found it in a backpack Mm -hmm. that I brought with me when I actually left home. And I found it one day just rummaging through my stuff. And you know, it was kind of like a, a full circle moment. Cause at mm. that, at that point I was like two months, two months since I left home. So yeah, man, I think it's always about just keeping, always believing in yourself. I think that's what it's mm. all about. You know? Sure. What can you, what can you say about the, the, the journey that these academies gave you in New York Red Bulls and PDA and sort of the level of development they, they prepared you for um, eventually stepping into further paths? Absolutely. I think uh, both organizations did a, a fantastic job. You know, I started at PDA, I think when I was nine or 10 and then made the switch to Red Bulls at, at 12, I believe. And then from 12 to 15 was there and then went back to PDA mm-hmm. at 15. But, you know, overall, you know, it was uh, being probably the t- two best academies in New Jersey. Yeah. Being able to compete with the best players in the area. And then at the end of it, to uh, always be able to learn something, to always be, be willing to be coached, to learning from players that maybe are better than you at certain things. And at times, accepting your, your weaknesses, you know? Mm, yeah, Like sure. being able to, to be honest with yourself and say, okay, this is what I need to do in order to push myself to the next level, you know? Mm, yeah. So 
fast forwarding a bit into uh, February 2018, you actually committed to playing soccer at Cornell University with dreams of potentially being drafted into the MLS. However, that all changed when AS Roma came calling. What was this whirlwind like of the emotions of you deciding your, your future? It was definitely an interesting couple of months, that's for sure. I mean, there were, there were days in which I said to myself, you know, sitting down with my parents and, and my sister trying to decide what the, the best course of action was to take. I think speaking to people that I trust, coaches at, at PDA at the time, um, even my teammates, uh, just trying to see what they have to say. But it was, uh, it was kind of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in the sense that you know, I said one day, okay, I'm going to school. I'm going to school. Um, because at the end of it, the, the thought process was if I graduate with a degree from Cornell, even if I step foot on campus and then decide to, to go and play after a year, I can always go back and, yeah. and get that degree. Right. Um, but after sitting with my parents and being honest with myself, it was, about it was really about what's what's going to make me happy in the long run um and my thought process was like i know for a fact every single day if i'm on campus i'm going to be thinking about what could have been mm -hmm. so sure. it was like i said it wasn't a an easy decision but i would do it 10 times over again if i yeah. if i had to you know uh -huh. i'm i'm <clears throat> i couldn't be happier with the decision that i made did did Roma do any convincing in uh, you know steering you away from this study degree and potential in America and inspire you to to take a chance abroad? Uh not so much. They didn't really have anything to do with uh, the decision making process. You know, I actually I went there the summer beforehand on trial and didn't really think anything of it. Okay. Uh, came back home thinking that was a great experience. You know, and as soon as as soon as I get back, as soon as I got back home, um, you know, getting ready for next year to prepare myself for the college season, I, I got a call uh, uh, from them offering me a contract for, for the next year. Mm. And it was never a conversation in which Roma was like, listen, you shouldn't go to school. It was really just like, this is what we're offering you. Let us know what you think. And once you have an answer, you know, we can talk things over, but the club was actually super, super flexible and super respectful in that sense, because they gave me the option for the first six months of my contract to have the ability to actually come back to the, mm. back to the U S and, and go to school. Mm. Um, so it was kind of like a, <clears throat> an, an adaptation period in which I was, I was in Italy and, but I, at the same time, I knew I had it in my back pocket that I could go back to school. But mm. to be honest with you, as soon as I got there, I knew that wasn't what I wanted. And, you know, that kind of just went out the window. Yeah. Um, yeah, you so cl clearly you've, you've chosen the path of uh, playing Roma, playing abroad. Um, yeah, I, I guess. Can you sort of explain like a, a bit more just the feeling of you coming to Roma and yeah, knowing that, oh, I'm definitely just going to be here. Mm. Well, it's kind of, I don't think it hit like it didn't, it was, it was kind of shell shock in the beginning, like watching, watching Serie A growing up, you know, watching pretty often. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally being at the, the training ground and, you know, mm. being amongst the first team, mm. you know, it was never, it never fully set in until, you know, maybe a, a week or so after I was into it. Um, mm. Obviously I was super excited, but to be perfectly honest with you, my initial reaction was just like, okay, this is, this is my reality now. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think it fully set in until the first time I trained with the first team. And, you know, training with guys like De Rossi and Calderon mm -hmm. and, yeah. and Florenzi, and, you know, it just kind of puts things into perspective. Um, but then again, you know, you, there was a huge, huge chunk of time needed to feel comfortable with myself 
um, both on and off the field, adapting to a new language and new culture, and really a, a completely different style of play that I wasn't used to. Uh, so you know, it was really about okay, I need to I need to concentrate on these things in order. Like it's, it's the same conversation over and over again, like realizing what it is that you need to work on every single day to put yourself in the best position to succeed in the long run. Um, and in the beginning, it was, uh, it was a lot of conversations that made me feel like I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. Um, because tactically Italian soccer is like night and day compared to American soccer. Yep. Like everything is so much more rigid and mm. having a, a coach who was extremely experienced and, you know, had his, his style of play, you have to abide by what he says, or it's, it's difficult for you to be put on the field. It's difficult for you to be viewed as trustworthy if you can't follow in simple directions, you know? Yeah. And I think always being the, the main guy, always being the one to go to in, in any game scenario back when I was in the U S to, just being a, a piece of a team yeah, was definitely a big, 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 big thing that I had to adjust to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. It's it's like you see these guys, you play them on FIFA, mm-hmm. watch them on TV, and then, oh, they're just like Danielle over there. It's just yeah. just the guy. Um, of course, yeah, right. And in 2018, summer 2018, just after your 18th birthday, you joined AS Roma and slotted into the U19 squad. So as an Italian-American, did Italy feel like home or was it just a crazy uh, change of environment? Well, I even, when I first got there, I even told a lot of people the way that I grew up in the U.S. was basically, as an Italian, just without the language. Yeah, okay. You know, my, my grandparents are, are, are immigrants. They came to the U.S. around 50 years ago. Uh, my, my father is a first-generation American. So all of those Italian ideals and, and cultural be- beliefs are really ingrained into, into my lifestyle. Uh, that being said, there was a, a, huge, a huge adjustment in terms of, I think, I, I think since, I've, since I've been away from home, I realized why Americans like to come to, to Europe and Europeans like to come to the U.S. Because it's just... Uh, hmm. We move at a different pace. In the US, yeah. it's always 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Right. And in Europe, you're able to you know, take a step back and really analyze exactly what you're doing. Back in the US, you don't even have time to, to think, about, to, to think right. about what you're doing, you know? Hmm. Um, so I think I definitely had to adjust to that. You, know, you, you realize that you have to be able to morph yourself in a way yeah. to be able to become one with your surroundings and become comfortable in your own skin in a completely new place. Mm-hmm. And with time and patience, it comes, but unfortunately things like that don't come overnight. Uh, right. It's all about, you know, for lack of a better term, trusting the process, you know? Sure. How'd you, how'd you come to sort of adjust yourself to this, this huge, bigger environment and uh, ingrain yourself in, in Roma? Well, I think I had a lot of help from my teammates and, and the coaches. Uh, I think also being able to really immerse myself in the culture and not really having another choice you know when you're forced to learn things it comes a lot more naturally as if for example like i think the the biggest example is with the language so Mm -hmm. amongst my teammates there were there were a few guys that actually spoke english and the entire coaching staff only spoke italian Mm -hmm. so for myself i i came to italy with a decent base like i had a, a pretty good understanding but the complete to to create sentences and you know, answer on the fly was, right. it was difficult in the yeah. beginning, but being in that type of environment every single day, you learn whether you like it or not. Um, and like I said, it just, 
it takes time. It takes a lot of time and patience. There's going to be good days, going to be bad days. And I think being able to find the balance, uh, especially on and off the field, because when your life is basically revolves around everything you do on the field, it's kind of difficult to detach yourself and, you know, look at things from a different perspective and be able to say, Oh, I had, a, I didn't have a great training session today, but it's not going to, it's not going to affect me for the rest of the day. Like I'm able to be myself off of the field. Not that you have to be a player 24, seven, 365, mm-hmm. which I think a lot of, I think a lot of athletes struggle yes. with um, yes. being able to say like, okay, I'm me, but on the field, I need to be something else. Like I need to turn into a different person in that sense. I think, there's so many examples in so many different sports. You think of Kobe and LeBron and Michael Jordan, where, you know, when they're on the, when they're on the court, they become a different animal. Um, I think it goes both ways. Being able to detach and just be a a person again is so important. And I think being away from home and not going home to a family setting every single day Mm. makes you mature that much faster and realize that, okay, this is all on me. Like there, nobody's, nobody's here with me. Nobody's living the same reality as I am. Therefore I need to come to my own conclusions through trial and error. And there were a lot of days where I was like, well, that didn't really work. So let's try something new tomorrow Mm -hmm. to try to stay level, to try to stay level headed regardless, whether you know, I score a hat trick at the weekend or I score six own goals. Like it shouldn't yeah. really matter when I step off of the field. I should be able to be myself and be content with that. Hmm. So in a sense, you were not only attempting to prove yourself to others, but prove yourself to yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think it was, I think it was more of a, a personal journey more than anything. Right. Yeah. So of, of course you're you're following in the footsteps of uh, already a famous American play for Roma, Michael Bradley, who appeared 40, 41 times for the yellow and red. Did you have any football idols or even you know sports athletes uh, in other sports that you look up to? Well, my favorite, I don't know, football, soccer. What what term should I be using here? <laughs> well, I'd say for the American listeners, soccer is good. However. I'm I'm starting to pick up some Europeans and they get really mad when I say soccer. So I'll just go with football. All right, so we'll go with football then. I yeah. would say my favorite my favorite football player of all time is is Andrea Pirlo. Oh, for well, me, yeah. of for me, he's just like the epitome of class. And yeah, I don't think we'll ever see another player like him. Uh, yeah. I think also the way that the game is moving, mm-hmm. guys like him are. Yeah, they're not. Style. They're not really. T- they're not really taken into consideration anymore. Right. Like if you're not able to cover as much ground as possible as a as a a deep lying midfielder, it's kind of difficult for you to get into a team, uh, especially with so many teams playing four th- four through three in recent years. Now things are kind of shifting in terms of playing three at the back and having having wing backs that are bombing up and down the entire game. But that being said. You know, the game is just becoming so much more physical mm-hmm. and, you know, the matter of the fact is the more you can run, the better, the better off you are. Yeah. But that being said, man, like for me, I don't think there ever, there will ever, ever, ever. And then I think I also draw inspiration from guys like Kobe, like Kobe yeah. Bryant for me is the, is the ideal sportsman. Right. If you, if you want to compare, he, he's in a category of his own for me. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of his drive, his determination, his, his never give up attitude. It's something that I tried to add into my, not only into my professional career, but into my everyday life. Mm-hmm. Uh, try to value myself on those characteristics as a person. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, he's actually, he's unmatched. He's he's the best, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, Gianna. And um, yeah, for sure, legacy will, will forever continue. So transitioning into your your first season of football for uh, for Roma, 
you fought for minutes playing between right back center midfield and defensive midfielder. Were you expecting this sort of challenge, this culture shock and environment and just sort of working towards uh, becoming a better player? Yeah, you know, I, I knew it wasn't going to be easy going in. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the biggest transitional piece for me was tactics, just being tactically disciplined. In the beginning, for lack of a better term, I was a disaster. Mm. I was a disaster. You know, mm. everything they were telling me, everything I was doing was wrong. Mm. And in the beginning, it was frustrating because I didn't, one, I didn't completely comprehend what was going on. And two, I think when you're in that, when, when you're frustrated with yourself, it's difficult to completely listen to the people around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I've definitely, it's something that I still need to work on today. Um, but that being said, the first couple of months, it was also a, a question of trying to find my best position mm-hmm. because my whole life back in the U.S., I was just, I played wherever. Like I, I played wherever the team needed if the team needed a center back, I played center back. If the team needed a left winger, I played left winger. Mm. Team needed an attacking midfield, I played attacking mid. Um, so going in as a defensive midfielder, they started putting me a right back and left back and center back. And it was difficult for me in the first six months to actually learn individual tactics because in training sessions, I wasn't cemented in one place. Mm-hmm. I was trying to adjust to all of these different positions at, at one time. And it wasn't the best circumstances, but that being said, I think in the long run, it's going, it, it has and will serve me well because it's given me a different perspective of the field yeah. in 360 degrees. Um, but as time went on, I think I remember it was January where speaking with the coach and with the club, they saw me as a, a right or left back um, hmm. for that team for, for my first year. And from that point on, I, it started to click a lot more. You know, I was six months in, getting the language down, making stronger relationships with my teammates, making stronger relationships with the, the coaching staff and even the, the higher staff members. And just feeling a lot more confident. And then at that point, I was training a lot with the first team, getting lots of advice from world-class players. And when you're in that environment every single day, everything just kind of comes naturally. And from that point on, uh, I really felt like I was seeing things a different way and comprehending the game a lot more than I was when I had first arrived. Do you have an example of uh, a piece of advice from a first team player? Yeah, I remember one time uh, I was playing left back with Kolarov and I think Manolas playing the, playing as the two center backs. Okay. And I remember one time I didn't I didn't drop off enough to receive the ball. I was kind of I wasn't I wasn't wide. I was inside. Right. Yeah. And color of like bites my head off and is like, you need to get wide, otherwise I'm not gonna give you the ball. Like we're everyone's gonna go into into trouble if if you're not an outlet. Even if even if I don't give you the ball, you need to be there because you open up space for other people. And that was it was we played like a, a mini game, maybe 20 minutes. So the first half, you know, I was really inside and uh wasn't really following what he was saying. <clears throat> now after the in the first in excuse me. In the second half, I started to take his advice and, you know, I did, I did very well in the session. And, you know, he came up to me after the training session and gave me a pat on the back and was like, it's just, uh, it's just those little confirmations that help you not only mentally, but, but physically to say like, okay, this is, this is where I belong. Like, I, I know what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. Besides sure. that, besides that own self, your own self belief, you know, having another person come up to you, especially like him, who's mm-hmm. somebody I've watched yeah. for the past 10 years. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely helpful. Definitely helpful. Right. Of course. So going into the second season, um, you found your place in the squad, uh, more or less, and began to play more games. You appeared 10 times in the, um, Primavera, including, uh, running games as defensive midfielder, which is, uh, 
sort of, I guess, your preferred position? Um, at it's this a point, really good question, man. I still don't know what my preferred yeah. position is. <laughs> well, that's okay. You can, you can always thought it and you know that uh, James Milner, you know, everywhere, or, you know, likes of Philip Lom or uh, Yastro Kimmich, you know, right back, left back. You're you're fine. We're we're perfect. We're absolutely man. U.S. could absolutely. could use someone like that easily. Um. So at this point, how did you feel among the the squad, and uh, did you sort of have a game plan of um learning the experience that you had, and then potentially looking uh, at different places in uh, in the squad or in uh, Italy? So at the beginning of last season, I came in a lot more sure of myself. You know, it was a it was a familiar place. I wasn't coming into new faces. More or less, the squad was the same. Um, and I think I took more of a more of a a bigger role in the sense of trying to influence the team much more. Um, I think my confidence was was through the roof, especially mm-hmm. during preseason last season. Um, I remember coming in and just really enjoying myself. Uh, then first couple of games of the season, we had some, some tough results. And then unfortunately around this time last year, maybe a couple of weeks prior, yeah. I actually got sick and I missed like a month and a half of the season. Huh. So I came back after the holidays and after a couple of training sessions, I was, was slid back into the team. And, you know, I think from that point, I, from a mental standpoint, I was, I was flying. I was flying. Um, I was spending a lot of time with the first team as well last season under a new manager playing a different system. Mm. So there was a, a different, a different aspect to everyday life where you Mm. didn't know exactly what the squad was going to be doing because the Paulo Fonseca who, who came in last season at Roma was, he had like a, a different, not only a different style of play, but a different cultural background. Mm. You know, in the past, I want to say 10 years, most of the managers of Roma have been Italian. Um, bringing in a guy, uh, a, Portuguese, a, a Portuguese guy who's had experience in many different countries kind of changed the dynamic as a club. And I think you, you can see that today. The, the style of football that they play, um, even the, the work ethic and, you know, the want to, to play for one another. I think it's, it's, it's obvious. And being in that environment and seeing just a completely different thought process on everything. I actually, I think it was maybe a month into his tenure at Roma. Um, I wound up having a conversation with him and, there was a lot of things that we saw eye to eye on being foreigners. Hmm. You know, he, <clears throat> we spoke about the fact that most Italian teams play the same, you know, the philosophy of football is so, 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 so rigid. It's like they only see things one way sometimes. Mm-hmm. And having a guy like that come in and kind of turn everything upside down, especially in the beginning, there was lots of rumors that are like, Oh, they're going to sack him. They're going to sack him. They're going to sack him. But it's just not something that, people were used to. And I think it's also, also refreshing because it shows that you don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can maybe just have to turn it upside down yeah. and it could change the entire world. Um, but getting back to the, to the squad, you know, I think playing as a defensive midfielder, I was able to solidify the team. You know, the, I knew that my, my homework in that sense was to, to, to keep the team balanced and not be out of position, especially when we didn't have the ball, but also have the ability to, to, to break up plays and start attacks. Um, and I think the biggest example of that, I think the, the best performance that I had in a, in a Roma shirt was, was around that time last year. I think it was like in the beginning of February, right before the lockdown. Um, in which I was, I had just come back from being sick and, you know, fitness wise, I was, I was feeling really good. And I think when you're in that frame of mind, you're able to go on to the field with a, with a clear head 
and everything just just flicks. Yep. Was it was it common for for players to be called up to the to the, the first team from their youth teams, or was it different for you? And did was it sort of prompted in the fact that you were doing something different that they they liked and they they wanted you to be in the first team? Well, I think a lot of the times. I, I mean, I can only speak about Roma. Roma, the 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 coaches that were there, they usually called guys in from from the Primavera for in in positions that they were missing. So yeah. if guys were injured, you know, there was always somebody to fill in in that position. Mm. Uh, specifically, my first season with Di Francesco and and Ranieri, uh, the type of training sessions that we did were a lot of 11 v 11 stuff. So you need at least 22 guys in the field at all times. Um, and there was usually even guys on the side waiting to get in just to rotate. Hmm. So last year, my, my first season, I think they called me in a couple of times as a fullback. And then I think there was a period in which I was with the first team for three or four weeks where I didn't even go back to the Primavera. Because I think somebody was injured and, you know, I was, I was doing well at that time. But I think it really, it really depends. I mean, I think the fact that I wasn't playing much my first season with the Primavera also affected maybe my, my involvement with the first team. Mm. Because it's, not, it's, it's almost impossible for you to go from not playing with the under-19s and then, you know, sure. being brought up to, to, yeah. to play with the first team. At that time, I was I was training really well and feeling super confident, but maybe the the lack of minutes didn't allow me to make that next step. Um, and then the next season, it was it was pretty much the same thing, just like a a different style of training, um, in which guys were pulled up more from recommendation than necessity. Where if if Fonseca liked you, you would be called in more. Rather than maybe the first season, it was more out of okay, we need a left back, we need a attacking midfielder, we need a striker, you know. Mm. Um, and I think it it showed this season. Like a bunch of my teammates from last season have made their their debuts. They've been given the opportunity. I think also because of lack of numbers due to COVID cases and mm-hmm. injuries and other things that, that are going on within the club. But the matter of the fact is, is the club is incorporating, incorporating a lot more young players into the, into the squad, which is fantastic to see, you know, it's, yeah. I think even for guys below them, it shows like, okay, there is a path. Like there is, there is an opportunity as long yep. as I'm, as long as I realize like, okay, that's my objective. And I think for a, a 12 year old, a 13 year old, all the way up to 17 before you get to the Primavera, like seeing the first team every single day is like a reaffirmation. Like, okay, that's where I need to be. Walking past the first team, walking past the first team locker room, walking past the first team field, seeing the first team train, having like little interactions with the first team players, like it all cements everything to you. It keeps everything in perspective. It's like, okay, that's what I want. That's what I need. This is what I need to do to get there. And having more guys break through just makes those thoughts go through the roof. You know. Yeah, certainly. Um, you spoke on the fact that you you spoke with um, Fonseca, uh, but you've been among you know a variety of coaches, Premier League champion uh, Claudio Ronia. Mm-hmm. That that's that's amazing. Do you get to talk to to and sort of get to know these managers, and do they, do they have relationships with the players as well? Um, I know you know from the likes of like Carlo Ancelotti, his philosophy with managing a football team is it's all about the personal relationships and uh, sort of the squad being together as one, not necessarily just uh, playing with each other, but living with each other. Was it like that Roma and sort of uh, maybe you different from other managers, but yeah, all about just building those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I think each manager, like you said, has their own style and Di Francesco, Ranieri and Fonseca all had their own ways of doing things. Excuse me. That being said, all three of them were so professional. That was the first thing that you would notice. I remember 
it, it's all, it's really all about efficiency. Um, it's like, okay, we're going to be on the field for 40 minutes, but in these 40 minutes, we're going to do everything that we need to do to make sure that I, when Sunday comes around, we're ready. That everyone goes onto the field knowing what their individual task is and breaking it down to be as simple as possible. Hmm. With Di Francesco, his philosophy playing a 4 3 3 was having with, without midfielders that make runs in behind, his system really doesn't work. So he emphasized a lot on that and having the three guys, so the fullback, the winger, and the eight or 10, however you want to call it, the inside midfielders yep. combining and being on the save wavelength was, was, uh, what's, what's the word? Was, uh, <laughs> fundamental perhaps. Fun, there you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, was, was fundamental. It was absolutely necessary. And it was something that, you know, you just kind of beat into your head every single day. With Ranieri, it was more about how do we get to the goal as fast as possible? Hmm. It was like, how do we get from point A to point B? And I think in his... When, what, 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 sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> uh, when you're used to playing with uh, Riyad Mahrez and Jamie Vardy, that's, I absolutely. guess, what gets ingrained. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, but at the same time, also having flexibility and realizing that there's so many different games inside one game. So there's going to be points in a game where you suffer a little bit. You're, you're, going to need, you're going to be on the back foot and being able to adjust and know when to put your foot on the ball and kill the game, then knowing when to speed it up. Uh, he, was, he was all about building out of the back at times, but there were other times where we're like, okay, let's, let's just put it, to, like shove it down their throat, you know, put it, <clears throat> put it in behind and have them have to deal with us. Mm-hmm. And then we get the second balls and we're higher up the field. With Fonseca, it was kind of in the beginning. So he changed systems. When he first came in, they were playing a, I believe, a 4 2 3 1. 4 2 3 1. And having more or less having two underlying midfielders that were able to, to play off of one another and read each other's movements and having wingers or wide attacking midfielders that were intelligent enough to play with one another. And then I think due to injuries and, you know, maybe just having a, a change of after, after seeing the squad after a couple of months and they started the season so well, they were, I think in third or fourth place. And then they, around the new year, they had four or five losses in I think six or seven games. So at that point, he decided to change everything. You know, I think mm. the ideas he was trying to get across to the team just wasn't clicking. And then once they tra- changed to, to three at the back, you know, there, there was some transition needed in the beginning. And then specifically after the, the lockdown and trying to finish the season, the Roma won, I think, seven or eight games in a row. So being just not only believing in, in your own values, but making the team believe in what you believe in. Because if, if yeah. you have a player that doesn't buy into your system or doesn't buy into your beliefs, it's difficult for them to perform at the highest level for you on the field. Mm-hmm. I think when you have players playing for you and playing for the guy next to them, it's, it's obvious. You can tell. You can tell. Yeah. You can tell if there's problems in the locker room. You can tell if you know, two guys don't get along. Even as a, as a viewer, you don't need to be inside the club. You don't need to be with these guys every single day. You know, it kind of shows with the results. Right. So I think all of them just had a, a different style. And when it comes to, like you said, with, with Carlo Angelotti having a, a personal relationship with all of his players, I think it's just about having a common level of respect. You know, mm. if, you have an issue, we can speak about it and, squ- and squash it immediately. Like there's, there's really no need to, to beat around the bush. Um, yeah, I think, I think every, it also depends on your personality. You know, a lot of, I think coaches need to be psychologists before anything else. Right. They need to, yeah. 
they need to know what a player tick, what makes a player tick, you know, especially if they want to get the most out of them. They need to know like, okay, if I scream in this guy's face, he's going to curl up into a ball and I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to get that trust back. Mm -hmm. But then again, if you do that with another guy, it'll make him run that much more or be that more intense, whatever it may be. You know, we're as human beings, we all adjust and react differently to different circumstances. So I think the best coaches in the world are the best at doing that. Mm -hmm. You you speak so well on, you know, the philosophy for managers and coaches, although you're so, you're so young into your, your playing professional career is managing one day that you're potentially thinking about me and the, me and my cousin, we've actually spoke about it. I played with my, my cousin Boris for, for 10 years. You know, we grew up together. Um, you know, we talk about it a lot. We talk about it a lot. I think uh, a dream for me would, you know, once I finish my career to be able to go back to PDA and create a training ground similar to the ones that we have in, here in Europe, you know, be able to give American kids the, the opportunity. To, because if, if you, if you think about it, if you think about, I think, I think the biggest example is college locker rooms. Sounds kind of strange, but let me, let me explain mm -hmm. the amount of money invested into, into college, college football. Let's talk about college yeah. football. So I actually went to Rutgers university for a visit. And I saw the weight room for the football team. And it's probably six times the size of my house. <laughs> right? Yeah. And they give you the conditions and the opportunity to become the best you can be. And I think if all of the time and money and, and opportunity was given to young football players, the United States will be, be one of the, the powerhouses. Yeah. Because we, we have the players, and I think that's, that's right. coming into the light. That's, that's, that's come into the light in the, the past couple of years, you know, with guys like Tyler Adams and Christian Pulisic and Weston McKinney, yeah. even now Gio Reyna, you know, playing at, mm -hmm. at, the, at the highest level. And yeah. I think it, it starts with, having the right conditions. Mm -hmm. So for me, that would be, I don't know. I don't know what I'm managing. You know, it's, uh, it's something that I think about a lot, but you know, definitely remembering where I come from and be yeah. able to, to give back. I think that's, that would be the best case scenario for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Growing, growing that competitive environment that they have in Europe, is just something that's absolutely necessary in the U S so many young players, only like you, like you have, you know, immediately turn to Europe, the first chance they get, you, the U.S. just doesn't, doesn't provide that like first team level unless you're like, so, you know, Alfonso mm -hmm. Davies, which can get into that first team and the MLS at 16 um, and then travel abroad. But well, I gotta be honest. I think, I think in the next couple of years, I would say in five to 10 years, a lot of guys are, are going to be interested in coming to play in the U.S. I think the MLS really? in a short amount of time is going to become one of the best leagues in the world. I think if, mm. if the MLS is able to incorporate the system and <clears throat> structure that the top European leagues have, have in place right now, the MLS will, will explode. I really, I yeah. really think it will. I really think it will. Yeah. And I, I think I we've think, seen, I, 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 sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, sorry, I'll go after. No, I think, I think we've seen glimpses, glimpses of it. You know, I think there's, I think the, the most exciting thing right now is how fast the national team is progressing. You know, having guys like this year, we've, we've broke, broken the record for the amount of players Champions that have played League. in Champions League games. Yeah. Like that's incredible. Yeah. You know? Everything is moving in the right direction. So why not right. have, like why why can't Americans stay home and play in the best league in the world? Why can't that be an option? Yeah. You know? Why yeah. can Europeans want to come to play in the U.S.? 
Like we have the capabilities to do it. You see it in every other sport. So why, what, what is it that we're not doing for that to happen? Like there's something that isn't clicking. I don't know exactly what it is. I think we're on the way to figuring it out, but whether it be a year from now, five years, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I think the sky is the limit once we're able to, to crack it down. Yeah. I think in the U S you know, the first soccer was born basically in the U S in 1994 or reborn perhaps after, um, you know, the, the world cup happened in, uh, in the U S that was a huge boom. The MLS was founded and then, you know, you transitioned from there. 2014 was the last such thing. And then we lost all of our momentum in 2018. Mm-hmm. I think the problem nowadays is just, you know, there is no, none of that transition. It's MLS and then the few academies that they have, which is great. However, it's just such a small amount of players. Leagues like the USL are, you know, promoting uh, the likes of community clubs rather than just these, these huge big market teams. And I think it's all about promoting that like less parity, but yeah, like, like all other leagues in the world have its um, teams operating on their own and then having the ability to have links to other teams in the U.S. All of our other sports are the best in the world. So we have no problem attracting talent and such Or in the U.S. It's, it's difficult to, to do so when there's just such a less, um, there's no pathway really to, unless, uh, unless you're the best, which, you know, not everyone can be, but hopefully right, right in the future, we can have these such environments and, uh, and bring soccer to that, to that next level. I gotta be honest. I think, uh, MLS clubs are doing a a good job in bringing in homegrown players. Sure, yeah. A lot I of guys in a lot of guys in recent years have have broken through from the academy and done extremely well. I give you two examples: two guys that I played against in the academy, Brendan Aronson and Mark McKenzie, who oh, uh, yeah. who are with uh, who are with Philly. Um, mm-hmm. The thought process of like, okay, we don't kn- we don't need to go. And take a guy from these countries. We have them in our backyard. Right. You know? There's no need for us to go out and buy an attacking midfielder. There's no need mm-hmm. for us to go out and buy a center back. Like maybe right now they're not the finished product that we want them to be. But if we invest time into them and give them the right environment, they can flourish and in the long run, not only make us money, but grow our fan base. And I think at the end of the day, and I'll be like the MLS, those are probably the two most important things. And everyone wins. The player moves on to a better opportunity, not only economically, but professionally. Being in, uh, Brendan is a perfect example. Like now he's going to play uh, Red Bull Salzburg. There you go. There you go. Uh I think that's what it's about. It's about giving young players the opportunity to to flourish and then move on to the next step. But like I said before, maybe the MLS can be that next step. Instead of players saying like, okay, I, I'm going to do really well next season in MLS so I can go to Europe. Hmm. Guys can say, okay, I'm going to do shoot. I'm going to, I'm going to kill it next season to win the championship in MLS. That's not, that's really not the conversation right now. I get it. Like that's, that's why I yeah. left home because yeah. the, the yeah. highest, the highest level is, is here in Europe. Um, mm-hmm. But I think as an, as an American, I think as a, as a lover of the sport, nothing would make me happier than to see MLS make that next step. Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, yeah, like becoming a selling league is definitely something that um, uh, we are sort of moving towards and going towards that like maybe second tier, like the likes of the Eredivisie or the, the Portuguese, league, Portuguese league, Liga Nos. Um, not necessarily, you know, your your Champions League winning clubs, but maybe in the future there's a, we have a world league where uh, the top MLS teams can compete and we can sort of start to compare ourselves with uh, with teams abroad. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? 
So uh, that that was a really interesting conversation. So now let's 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 go into the um, <laughs> back back to you playing soccer again. I guess football football. <laughs> All right. So now 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 in twenty twenty, you're on loan to Potenza Calcio, a city with a population of only sixty eight thousand. Only you know a little bit smaller than than Roma's three million. Have you experienced uh, this smaller town and this uh, you know a, a family club perhaps? Yeah, it's definitely a completely different environment. Uh, I think being at a team competing in one of the best leagues in the world, being in a city like like Rome, which in my opinion is the most unique city in the world. Hmm. And then really having to, to transition completely again to a, a smaller reality, a, like you said, more of a family club. It really uh, puts things into perspective for you. Gives you uh, a different outlook on everything. Hmm. But since I've gotten here, I've... I've learned a lot about myself again. Like it's about making the most of every opportunity. It's about not only making, making yourself better and worrying about what you need to do to get better, but it's also about helping the guy next to you and making sure that they're doing what they need to do mm. to get to the next step or at least help the team. Um, Luckily, I, I live with, with three other guys that have come from, from Serie A clubs. So mm. we more or less have the same mentality in that sense. Our objective mm. is to, to get back to where we were. And I think that want and that desire kind of needs to bleed into the entire team. Because the, the reality is a lot of these guys haven't, have never experienced that. And the fact that we have been fortunate enough to, it's our responsibility to hold everybody to a certain standard and make sure that everything that we're doing is at the highest level. And that being said, I think having a fan base who is so connected and mm. even before like, when I go into my groceries or, you know, <laughs> just go out to take a walk, I, I see somebody in the streets and just have a quick conversation, you know, <laughs> about that. Those, those little interactions that, you know, kind of put a smile on your face. Have you, have you been asked to take uh, some selfies before? Uh, I have not. I have not. You know, the, just wait. the fans are, <laughs> The fans are super, 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 super respectful. You know, they, uh, yeah, okay. they realize that you know, it's, for us, it's not a problem. And I got to be honest, for me, if somebody wants to take a picture, it's kind of, kind of weird, you know? Because yeah, yeah, like, sure. I, I don't look at myself like that. I'm just, yeah. I'm just I, I, it's hard to explain. It's hard right. to explain. Like, I, yeah. I think putting it in my head that I'm somebody or I mean something is strange to me. Yeah. Um, but that being said, like the environment overall is, is positive. Um, being able to feel appreciated, mm -hmm. whether we win, lose or draw. You're you're in the Serie C, but it's it's a professional team. You know, it's um slightly different to just playing in the uh you know in the Primavera at Roma. Can you sort of compare and contrast maybe the different environments? Um, I'm not sure. Have have you experienced fans being in the uh in the stadiums for the games, or is that is that allowed or not allowed? We have we have like uh sponsors, so the people that are excuse me really just connected to the club. So maybe we'll have like 50 people in the stands, but okay. the, the rest of the stadium is, excuse me, is empty. Uh -huh. But I think the biggest difference is having 
older people in the locker room. Um, hmm. You know, I've, it's really the first time where I've been the young guy hmm. or the, the youngest, one of the youngest guys on the team, more or less, you know, when I was younger, I would play up. I would play with guys that are maybe two, a year or two older than me. Hmm. But now there's guys on my team that are 14, 15 years older than me. Um, I think it's all about learning from them and having them also learn from myself and, and the rest of my teammates um, because we all bring different experiences and, and different qualities to the, to the field of play. And having that, that respect amongst one another and being able to, to feed off of that is, is vital. It's vital. I think knowing that majority of the guys on your team have already gone through that first experience of being in a first team mm. and them knowing maybe having a different experience but at the same time, knowing the ropes a little bit and <clears throat> make you be that much more efficient. Sure. So, so going, I guess, out of um, and into the future of Potenza, do you, do you, after your almost first complete season of uh, professional football, do you sort of understand like and have for yourself a plan of what where you want to play going forwards whether it be at, at roma or at some other teams or is it just sort of day by day and then position wise going from there sorry position wise um or what like team i would of, like to play for yeah yeah something like that i just i just want to to play i just want to enjoy myself um i think for me the objective next season is to to play at a higher level um like the rest of my my roommates um our objective is to to help this team as much as we can to be to be able to make that jump and wherever that may be um for me i just want to be able to to grow and i think the only way that i'm going to be able to grow is playing as much as possible playing as as much football as I can. Um, that being said, training every single day <clears throat> and being in a good environment, but not having match experience is, is, is one thing, but, you know, having the match experience on top of it completely revolution revolutionizes you as a player, you know, the ability to make mistakes and learn from them, the ability to be in, tight match situations the ability of knowing when to decision making you know when to close a game out when to risk when not to risk these are all things that come with playing it's not something that you can just pick up a book and learn you know it's a uh, these experiences that you need to have so i think for me the most important thing is to play as, as much as possible wherever it may be um, and knowing if I'm able to do what I know how to do on the field, my play will speak for itself. And, um, you know, the, the, the sky is the limit. Right. Yeah, certainly. And on the international side of things is the, maybe it's the U S men's in your, in your thoughts or even potentially, uh, Italy. Yeah, man, I, um, I think it's a no brainer for me. A no brainer. Um, if I have to choose between the two, I'm picking the US 100 times out of 100. You know, it's really like it's uh, it's home for me. You know, that's that's where I grew up. I, I lived I lived there for 18 years. You know, I have all my friends, my family, uh, my loved ones. Everyone's back home in the US. So if I if I hopefully have the opportunity to represent my country it would be a, a dream come true uh and i think i keep that in the back of my mind um i think also watching you know other americans doing well around europe like it's it's inspiring man. It's inspiring yeah. 
I think uh, really, I, th- I think in the past, the idea of Americans playing soccer was super frowned upon, especially by Europeans. Like, oh, they can't play. Like, they just kick the, f- they just, they just, they, they really don't know exactly what they're doing. Um, and I think even as a country, it's all about proving people wrong. It's all about that, that fighting and winning and never back down attitude. Yeah. And I, I think that's what we're showing the world. And I think we'll continue to do that. And for me, I think uh, taking baby steps and just trying to improve every single day is the only way for me to get to where I want to be. Um, which is to to play at the highest level, to play it, play for my country, to play in the Champions League. Um, yeah, man, uh, that's that's what it's all about. It keeps me uh, keeps me focused. I, I look forward to to twenty twenty six when you're playing on home soil and MetLife, in the World Cup final. That's gonna Hope be a so, glorious man. day. That would be a that would be a dream. That would be a dream from Chris. Well, Janara, it's been a fantastic almost hour now. Um, Likewise, man, I really interview. appreciate it. Talked uh, through a bunch of amazing things. I hope the best for your future of career. Um, I'm following you now. On um, I have I have to definitely get a a Roma jersey, and you're even on a, on Foot Mob. So I like marked you a, a star player. You can you can do that. So I have your very updates nice for fun. everything. Very nice man. All right, uh, thank you very much, and uh, have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for man. your time. Have a good one, man. All right, peace. Spot out.